everybody, welcome to our Neocon Talks. I'm Elise Shapiro from Work Design Magazine. And thank you for, this is our inaugural series for Home and Home Art. Uh, and our sponsors are Formica, Flux, Sakura, and Dermarine, who are kind enough to furnish the space. We have giveaways and stuff to win. Uh, we have a Yeti Work Design Month, which is really good. And chairs, uh, the vignette here, there's a wrap for top of this. And uh, let me see, winners will be selected after Neocon. So uh, at workdesign.com, our uh, digital publication, we're going to have recaps of all of our sessions. So if you don't subscribe, please sign up. It doesn't cost anything, but it's really worth reading our content. It's fantastic. Um, and here we go. I'm, because they wanted to make a formal entrance, Katie Sargent is with Work Design, and her mom, who I also will say has been a friend for a million years, maybe not that many, Kay Sargent, who's Director of Workplace Design at HOK, and they're going to have a little fireside chat. So we can Thank, you. Thank you for coming. Anybody want to take bets on who's going to do better in this conversation? Because I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to go down. It is not a competition. Hey. Hi, Kay Sargent. Hi, Katie Sargent. How are you? I've never called you that professionally before. I always, I feel like I should say mom, but then it feels weird because, like, what do I put in email? Hi, mom. And no one else has that relationship. So instead, I just say hi. I don't know if you noticed that. Like, I never put your name. I feel like it's weird to call you Kay as Kay well. Hi, Sargent. Hi. <laughs> Well, thank you for being with us here today. Um, I have a few things I want to talk to you about. Some of them I didn't tell you about. All right, I want to talk to you first about, would you recommend this industry to one of your children, yes or no, and why? And, and Okay, see, here's the problem. I can't lie, because she knows the truth, because her brother did come to me and say he wanted to be an architect, like halfway through college, and I'm like, yep, yeah, nope, not doing it. Not A, you're already halfway through college, and B, it's just not the profession for you. But yes. I would. I, I think it's a profession that you have to work really, really hard in, but if you're passionate about it and you have a skill set for it, then I think you're going to thrive, and um, I think it's a great profession, actually. I think you have a real opportunity. I really, truly believe, in my heart of hearts, that what we do can make a difference in people's lives. I really believe that. So, yes, I would recommend it. Okay be changed onto the next subject. How many countries have you been to? Like over 30, right? Uh, probably over, I think I just hit 45. And you had never left the country for personal vacation. It was always professionally. That is true. That's crazy to me. When you told me that and I knew how much you traveled. Let's just be honest. If you don't know me, I am the mother of five children. Okay, so A, I have an amazing wardrobe. It's just size 10 and in somebody else's closet. And death is my retirement plan with five kids, right? So I don't have a lot of leisure time. I don't know when you expected me to go on vacations overseas and with what money. I will tell you this one story though. Katie did go to, um, she went- I studied uh, abroad in the south of France. She studied, she studied yes. abroad and she kept calling me A, because she needed money, but let's just be honest there. But she kept calling me and saying, oh, mom, this is amazing, like you should come and visit. Finally, one day I just said, Katie, for the cost of me to come visit you, you literally could stay three extra weeks. She never asked me to come visit again, and the next thing I know, she was staying three extra weeks, right? It felt like an offer, so I, I took you up on it. <laughs> All right, I think that's fair, I think that's fair. Okay, so five children, how do you, I think I have my own answer, but I'm curious, what's your formula for maintaining that personal balance, because you were very involved in all of our lives, and then also that professional balance of being in a, a corporate office? Okay, that's the gut punch right there. Every mom in this room, like, just feel that in your stomach. I prefaced it with, because you were very involved in our lives. <laughs> so, I, I will say that, um, and, and if you don't know, I've been a single parent for 15 years. So let's add that onto this. Uh, I had a friend of mine 
look at me one time, I felt, uh, so first of all, when I had to start traveling a lot and taking a job, I sat down with the kids and I said, this is what it's going to take. Are you guys okay to that? And I believe very firmly that kids are as stupid as you let them be. And I basically said, you can't be stupid. Like you're gonna have to step up to the plate and you're gonna have to do a lot of this stuff. Katie is the wife that I never had. She, I, like seriously, she was, she did an amazing job. But I, I think A, you gotta set that expectation. Um, B, you, it, it took a lot. There were times that I'd be in New York for meetings and I'd fly home to be in a soccer game. Yeah. And fly back up the next morning. I will tell you this though, I did have another gut punch once um, for your youngest, for Carly, her youngest sibling. I missed a parent teacher conference. And I felt so bad. Yeah. Like I felt guilty. For an entire year, I felt guilty. And then the next year, I'm like, I am going to be at that parent teacher conference no matter what. I am going to, like, like, I don't care what it's going to take. And I busted ass to get to that parent teacher conference. And I'm so proud of myself for being there. We walk in, and her friends all look at her and run over. And I'm like, Carly, who's here with you? Your grandmother? Your brothers? And I'm like, oh, your mom. Ugh, whatever. Because everybody brings their mom, right? But the year before that I wasn't there, her two older brothers, Katie was in college, so her two older brothers who were in high school took her to the parent-teacher conference. She was the coolest kid in the entire school. And so I think part of it is also, I was grossly overrating myself. Like, I was all that. Like, me being there was all that different. I just realized, wow, she'd really probably just have her, rather have her brother here anyway. So I think you just have to keep it all in perspective. Yeah, and you created an environment that there was other support there, so it wasn't only on, on you to do. Yeah, you, you did a lot. My, my mother lived with us for about 10 years, so she did a bunch of stuff. But yeah, they, I think they all had to support each other, and they all had to rise to the occasion, and I think that made them uh, better people for that. I mean, look at you. Did, did I do too bad? No? I think I did okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, let's talk more about you in a professional aspect. You've been on a lot of sides of the industry. You've been in it for a long time. And I kind of want to frame this as advice to your younger self or other people that are also emerging and wanting to maintain that balance of you know their needs personally as well as professionally. Talking about being an expert, how do you position yourself with so many different things and expertise and niches to go into in this industry? How do you position yourself as an expert? So you want the snarky answer? Yeah. You work your ass off for 20, 30, 40 years and you become an expert at something. I mean, I've been doing this for 38 years. If I don't know something at this point, then that's kind of sad. But I have had people come right out of college and say, oh, you know, can I call you? I need to be an expert on this tomorrow. And it's just like, that's kind of not how it works, right? And then what do they say? Ten thousand hours? You have to put yeah, ten thousand hours. hours into it. Makes you an expert. Um, but, but I also think it's about finding your passion. And if you're passionate about something, then you're going to dive into it. And and I will tell you, um, these guys give me a ton of shit because I'm always working. I yes. always have my laptop open. I don't care what day it is. Like literally, it's never more than five feet away. Even when it's a movie, they don't like to watch movies with me because I want the lights on because I'm gonna be working on my laptop. Yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> so, um, but they gave me a bunch of grief once, and I finally just said, if you're doing something you don't really have to do, but you want to do it, is that really work? Because I do a lot of stuff related to my job that isn't in my job description, but I do it because I love it and I'm passionate about it, and so I don't really. I tell my boss this. I don't really feel like I'm working sometimes when I'm doing that because it is something that I'm passionate about. So it's not necessarily being an expert to put a title behind you or be in a certain group in an office, but more you care about something and you choose to continue to seek that out. Yeah, and, and I think my advice to anybody is, look, this is an amazing profession because there's so many different avenues that you can go into. Right. Um, my graduating class of college, within 10 years, there were 25 of us, only two of us were still practicing designers. Now you could say that was a total fail, but the other 23 were still in the profession, they were just doing other things, right? So they were either reps, or they were lighting designers, or they were, you know, this, and they went into different avenues, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about this profession, but over time, my, I've, I've 
morphed and changed. So you'll find this funny, but I started one of the first cat departments in Washington, D.C., and I used to be a cat expert. I don't even touch cat anymore or rabbit, right? Like, I, not at all. Uh, there was a period where I was one of the leading security experts in the entire country, running around designing a bunch of stuff for federal agencies and things like that. There was a period where I literally helped write ADA, that's how old I am, and then when it came out, helped roll it out across the country and traveled around doing that, um, or you know, just different things. So I think part of it is just constantly evolving and not getting so stale that you can't evolve and change. Yeah, and you evolved into different sides of the profession as well at different periods in your career in terms of what benefited you and the family. You've been on the design side, then you went to a developer, then you went to a manufacturer, then you went back to design, and each of those things served a specific purpose in that time in your life. Well, let's go back earlier, actually, because this is something that most people don't know about me. So um, I, be I became a uh, vice president of an architectural firm when I was 26 years old. And when I was having my third child, my husband and I kind of looked at each other, my husband, uh, and we kind of looked at each other and it's like, all right, whose calendar, like who's going to take time off or whatever. And, and we realized that we were making decisions about your future based on what fit our work schedules. And that just fundamentally felt wrong. And, but at that point, I was pretty successful. And I thought, I can't stop my career now because I've built up all this momentum. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me. I was in my mid-30s, like early 30s maybe. And I'm like, I'm going to be working for 30 more years. If I can't take a few years off now, like when am I ever going to be able to do that? And so we yeah. made a decision that I was going to take time off, even though I was more successful. But So I took time off. And But during that time, I taught, I consulted. I actually probably worked harder during that time when I wasn't working than I ever did. But but it also gave me a new perspective. So when I did go back a few years later, I felt refreshed and I could keep going. Yeah. How was your re-entry? Did you find that hard as a female to explain how you took off time to be with your family? Well, I, I will say this. Our profession is changing so quickly yeah. that I really didn't take time off. Like, I, I taught, I was consulting. Right, so you so had I, things that filled that right. gap. And I stayed very involved in my professional associations. Okay. So I actually was building my network and had new skills when I came back versus just burning myself out and not expanding my network. I know people that have taken five or six years off and, like, just totally turned their back. And then when they come back, it's like, what is all this stuff? Like, what's, right. what's rhino and what's this? And what you like, and then, then it's hard. Sure, it sure. Hard. So, still putting yourself as a priority, but also maintaining that connection to the profession. So when you're ready, did you see that little dagger, right? Like, did you well, see that little family, dagger coming across? Your family around? is a priority, and and doing what you need to do because I think this profession, among with other ones, is very demanding. And so there's this feeling that if I, like you said, if I take time off, am I going to be irrelevant? Well, and I felt really guilty actually. And I remember some of the best advice I ever got. A really good girlfriend of mine said to me, "Don't you ever." feel guilty about providing for your family. Don't you ever feel guilty about that, never. And so I think that really made me realize you can't do everything. And there are times that my family absolutely came first. There are times that my job came first. It is not equal balance. And what you hope at the end of the day is that it all washes out and that you kind of keep some blending and some perspective, but it's never perfectly balanced. I see people tearing up in the audience. Are, are you got moms out there that are dealing with this shit? Right? It's tough. I'm going to tell you a story. I was, anybody see the movie Bad Moms? It's a comedy, right? About suburban moms are laughing. I watched this with, my, with her younger sister. I couldn't watch the movie. I got halfway through. I was bawling. I said, this is not a comedy. This is a documentary of what it is like being a working mother in this country right now. And this is not, this is exactly what I was, I will never forget when I went back to work and my husband stayed home, people were like, oh, you know, I saw your husband at the grocery store with the kids. He's so cute. And I'm like, I'm back in the office. Nobody's telling me I'm cute. You know, you saw me in the grocery store every goddamn week. You never thought I was cute when I was that. Like the expectations were just yeah. so crazy. 
And that movie is the epitome. Matt, if you want to know what, what being a woman is like, watch Bad Moms, and not as a comedy, <laughs> as a documentary of the shit that we A dark comedy, about. if you will. Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about that that relevancy and how quickly this industry changes and that, that fear of, okay, if I leave, you know, will I be left behind? You've been in the industry for almost 40 years. How do you pivot and maintain that relevancy? You've talked about various expertises that you've had. Does that come through clients? Is that something that you see and forecast and are passionate about? I, I think you see a need for something or you have an interest in something and you just pursue it. Right, so I was always very technical, and so you know when, when we were doing security stuff, I loved that, and I started going down that path. Um, I I got into workplace strategy because, in a really weird way, um, clients and and they we're at the same point right now. By the way, for young designers, we're at the very same point right now. Nobody wants to make a damn decision, and so our clients are just spinning. They're just spinning because they can't make a decision. And so I realized, well, if I can make an argument that is undisputable, then they can actually move forward. And so I started to think and leaning into the science of design and workplace strategy to say, this is why you need to do something and why this is the right thing to do. And it's not a matter like, what you, one of my pet peeves is when designers are like, oh, do you like this? I don't give a shit whether you like it or not. Like, that's why you have a house. As a commercial designer, you're paying me to do what's right for your business, right? And understanding that, thank you, right? And so we have to be able to say, I get that you like blue, but the next CEO might hate it, yeah. right? And this is why this color is actually better for what you're trying to achieve in your business. There is a science to what we do, and we need to lean into that and lean in hard. Mm. So we've talked a lot about your upbringing in the industry and various hurdles you've had. Let's talk about now. How do you feel like the industry has changed? And now that you're in a position of power or leadership, how do you create an environment that it feels like you can put in the, the work that's necessary to get where you want to be in your career, but also you know be there for your your family or whatever you need personally? So I, I actually um, I actually think this is a really great time. I probably have like eight to ten years left in my profession because again, five kids, death is my retirement plan, and I only <laughs> wish I was kidding about that. Some days that day can't come fast enough for me, but that's a whole other story. Um, I think it's a really exciting time, and I think that we, my age, I'm 59, we have an obligation to the next generation of designers to try to leave this profession better off and, in, uh, and to really empower them. And sometimes I think the best thing we can do is just get the hell out of the way. There's some amazing young talent from our firm here in this room, and they're amazing. And our job is to inspire them, to give them direction. I actually often tell my team, you guys go do whatever it is you want. Make sure the client loves you. If somebody needs to be the pain in the ass or deliver the bad news, I'll, I'll take the bullet. I've got five kids. I've been ricocheted with bullets more time than anybody else out there. Bring it on, right? Um, but I think our job right now, I really truly think my job right now is to leave this profession in better standing and to get that next generation ready to go forward and do amazing things. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I just want to say on the record how much I admire you and appreciate you. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm kind of pissed because I said I was going to do this, so she brought me popcorn. Oh, I did bring you I a gift. Sorry, popcorn. sorry, sorry. Do you guys see popcorn? I, I don't think the Mart has popcorn anymore, which is smart because I'm sure that's hard to clean up, but here's your backup favorite gift, a Rice Krispie treat. Love it. All right, everybody, Kay Sargent, thank you so much.